meine Damen und Herren, liebe Freunde, liebe Kollegen vom Fernsehen, ich wünsche Ihnen einen guten Abend und heiße Sie herzlich willkommen im Goethehaus. Es ist schon immer mein Wunsch gewesen, Walter Benjamin im Goethehaus aus berufenem Munde würdig zu sein. And welcome to Goethe House. I have always wanted to have Walter Benjamin's important contribution acknowledged by a competent authority here at Goethe House. Your presence tonight indicates that you share my opinion. We had not counted on the attendance of so many friends of the Goethe House, of Walter Benjamin and Hannah Arendt, particularly in view of the current taxi strike. Wenn ich mich nicht täusche, gilt äh, Walter Benjamin äh, bei der Zunft, die ihm seinerzeit die Habilitation verweigerte, äh, zum Teil immer noch als umstritten. Das könnte ein Ehrentitel sein. Vielleicht werden wir darüber heute etwas hören. As far as I know, Walter Benjamin is still considered controversial by those in Germany who had denied him his appointment as a university professor. That could be seen as a badge of honor. Maybe we will learn something about that later. Tonight's speaker is also considered controversial, but for very different reasons. You surely do not need me to go into detail. Diese Berufung leitet sich aus anderen Qualitäten ab. Ich brauche da Ihnen gegenüber nicht ausführlicher zu werden. Eigentlich genügen vier Silben. Hannah Arendt. Meine Damen und Herren, liebe Freunde, der beste Hinweis auf Walter Benjamin ist natürlich Walter Benjamin. Und ich habe hier dieses mitgebracht. The best introduction to Walter Benjamin is, of course, Walter Benjamin. I brought this book so you can see he's now available in German and soon he will be in English too. While the two-volume edition of his writings has been out of print for years, this paperback has just been published, which I wanted to show you. Sie wissen wahrscheinlich, dass Benjamin heute so etwas ist wie berühmt. You probably know that Walter Benjamin is famous today, a classic example of posthumous fame. Among the many kinds of fame, the cheap and the exalted, posthumous fame must be the saddest. As Cicero said in the splendidly unsentimental pithiness of Latin, si vivi visessim qui morte viserunt, if they had only triumphed in life as they triumphed in death. So it appears, at least to anyone who's been close to a posthumously famous person. Jedenfalls nimmt es sich für den aus, der einem also berühmten oder nachberühmten im Leben nahegestanden hat. Benjamin war in dem Jahrzehnt vor Hitlers Machtergreifung in the decade preceding Hitler's seizure of power. Benjamin was well known, though not famous, as a regular contributor to Frankfurt's newspaper, to the journal Literary World, and to Frankfurt Radio. And he published three books that barely reached the public, The Origins of German Tragic Drama, the concept of art criticism in German Romanticism, and a collection of short aphoristic essays under the title One Way Street, that is, No Exit. When he took his life on the French-Spanish border in 1940, he was already as good as forgotten. In 1955, two volumes of his writings came out, edited by Theodore Adorno in Frankfurt, which, along with the aforementioned books, contained the most important of his critical essays, the great early essay on Goethe's elective affinities, which 
which von Hoffmannsthal had printed, the latter one on Karl Kraus, which appeared in the Frankfurter Zeitung, the works on Baudelaire and Proust, on Kafka, Brecht and Leskov, the essays on translation and the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, and finally the thesis on the philosophy of history, to name only the most important. A critical success, this publication immediately brought him considerably wider recognition than he'd experienced during his lifetime. And from this, it's easy to conclude that posthumous fame is the prize that goes to those ahead of their time, as if history were a kind of racetrack on which those who are farthest ahead run so fast that the spectator's eyes can't keep up with them. Well, it doesn't seem quite so simple to me. There is no manner of posthumous fame that hasn't been preceded by the highest recognition from the few who could truly judge. Recognition came in this case from the best of his contemporary authors, from Hoffmannsthal and Brecht, and from the best of his contemporary readers, some of whom would become authors themselves, like Adorno and Gershom Scholem, that friend of Benjamin's early years. Whether there is really such a thing as badly misunderstood geniuses, or whether this is just wishful thinking on the part of non-geniuses is hard to say. What is certain, though, is that posthumous fame won't be granted to them. Today, when we read in German periodicals about Benjamin's famous essays, or find in Anglo-American literary publications George Steiner's opinion that Benjamin belongs with Lukács, Edmund Wilson and F. R. Levis as representatives of the most vital of modern criticism, these assessments only confirm what some people, not very many, but not so few either, had known since the publication of the Elective Affinities essay in 1924-25. Fame is a social phenomenon, and society, to be able to function at all, has to separate people into categories and types. What it absolutely can't accept, and so can only recognize in retrospect, is the one of a kind. Dies ließe sich an dem Fall des Kafkaschen Nachruhm und es lässt sich im Nachhinein unschwer an dem Fall von Benjamin exemplifizieren. Entscheidend war, dass Hofmannsthal wortwörtlich recht hatte, wenn er den Wahlverwandtschaftsaufsatz des damals gänzlich unbekannten Autors schlechten unvergleichlich nannte. One example is Kafka's posthumous fame, another is Benjamin's. Hoffmannsthal was speaking literally when he called the elective affinities essay by the utterly unknown author absolutely incomparable. In fact, everything Benjamin wrote was unique. If I were to try to put him in a familiar literary category, I would immediately get tangled in a chain of contradictory statements. I could say he was scholarly, but he wasn't a scholar, that his main interest was texts and the interpretation of texts, but he wasn't a philologist, that theology, though not religion, fascinated him, but he wasn't a theologist or even especially interested in the Bible. Ich könnte sagen, dass er ein Schriftsteller war, dessen größter Ehrgeiz darin bestand, einen nur aus Zitaten zusammengesetzten Text. I could say he was a born writer, but his greatest ambition was to assemble a text solely out of quotations, thus eliminating himself as a writer. He translated Proust and Baudelaire. He was the first to translate Proust into German, but he wasn't a translator. He wrote countless book reviews and an array of classic essays 
influence on both past and present poets and writers, but he wasn't a critic. He wrote books on the German Baroque and German Romanticism, and he died in the middle of an ambitious work on 19th century France, but he wasn't a historian or a literary historian. Though I am going to try to show that he thought poetically, he was neither a poet nor a philosopher. Nun kann man aber die Sache des Nachruhms noch von einer anderen, weniger objektiven Seite betrachten, wie ich in dem Cicero-Zitat bereits anzudeuten versuchte. Now, you can look at posthumous fame from another, less objective side, as I just tried to show in the quotation from Cicero. For someone like Benjamin, who wasn't independently wealthy, the lifelong preparation for posthumous fame is nothing other than misfortune, a lack of a fortune, as Napoleon liked to call it. And misfortune was so characteristic of him in his life and so tied up with his work that I can't ignore it here. In both writing and conversation, Benjamin was always referring to a folk song from Des Knaben Wunderhorn, The Little Hunchback. If I go into the cellar to draw a little wine, a little hunchback down there grabs that jug of mine. If I go into my kitchen to cook a little stew, a little hunchback in there has cracked my pot in two. He often spoke of the hunchback, but only in a Berlin childhood around 1900 did he explain why it unnerved him so. When German children bungled, Mothers used to tell them, Mr. Clumsy says hello, and life told him the same thing. In his words, under this little man's gaze you forget to pay attention, either to yourself or to the little man. You just stand there, aghast, before the pile of broken glass. It would be easy to recount Benjamin's life, which an excellent two-volume collection of letters has now brought into full view, as a sequence of such piles of broken glass. He saw it that way himself. Nichts ist eindrucksvoller vielleicht für die bösen Späße des Buckligen als die Geschichte seiner missglückten Flucht aus Frankreich. Of all the hunchback's evil pranks, none makes a deeper impression than the story of Benjamin's ill-fated flight from France. During the summer of 1940, he was among the first to receive a so-called emergency visa to the United States. He was also in possession of the Spanish transit visa needed to reach Lisbon. At that point, you couldn't get a French exit visa, and you had to cross the border on foot, which wasn't too difficult. But when Benjamin arrived with a small group of refugees, it turned out that on that that very day, Spain's border had been closed. The border police wouldn't accept the visas, and the next day the entire group would have to return to France. So Benjamin took his life during the night, and then his companions were allowed through to Portugal. The visa restrictions were lifted a few weeks later. One day earlier, he would have been let right through. One day later, he would have found out in Marseille that the Spanish border was closed. Only on this single day was the catastrophe possible at all. Nur an diesem Tag war die Katastrophe überhaupt möglich. Aber bitte, missverstehen Sie mich nicht. But don't misunderstand me. For this kind of person there is neither pure luck nor pure grief, since both are sources of inspiration. That is the price of talent. Das ist der Preis der Begabung. Wenn die Glücklichen mit Recht sagen, wie sich Verdienst und Glück verketten, das fällt den Toren niemals ein. <laughs> 
So sollten Sie nicht vergessen hinzuzufügen, dass The fortunate say correctly that success and luck are linked, something that never dawns on fools. It never dawns on fools that, as Benjamin once said, there is a place where weakness and genius are one. For example, that Proust died of the same inexperience that had allowed him to write his great work. Benjamin, who knew these things well, chose to end a Berlin childhood around 1900 with the strange last lines of the old folk song. Oh, dear child, I beg of you, pray for the little hunchback too. Benjamins Bildungsgang ging von einem Studium der Philosophie sehr bald zu einer intensiven Benjamin's education proceeded quickly from the study of philosophy to intensive engagement with literature and finished around the middle of the 20s with a turn to the issues of revolution and the Marxist interpretation of history. Or so in any case does it appear from the outside. But if you look more closely into his work, it becomes clear that his very original way of thinking took its bearings from only two authors. Goethe throughout, and from the late 20s on, Bertolt Brecht from two poets, no philosophers, no theorists. At the center of Goethean thought stands the so-called Urphenomen, the primal phenomenon, which isn't an idea or a concept that lends itself to the development of a theory. It's something much more concrete, in which meaning, that Goethean word turns up constantly in Benjamin, in which meaning and appearance, word and thing, idea and experience coincide. Benjamin had an inkling of such a primal phenomenon in his unfinished magnum opus on the 19th century. When he spoke of the archetypal history of the 19th century, he meant a representation in which that century should stand for the archetypal form of history. Dies wiederum schien ihm möglich, weil der Zusammenbruch der Tradition, ich zitiere dauernd dazwischen, es ist schwierig immer zu sagen, Zitat, Zitat, ich werde versuchen, es stimmmäßig anzudeuten, indem ich etwas höher und etwas lauter dann spreche. Also, he thought this was possible because the collapse of tradition had exposed the archetypal moments in all of history, which was no longer obscured by ties to church and family. The old prehistory shrouds the environment of our parents. We are no longer bound to them by tradition. Auf diese eigentümliche Traditionslosigkeit werde ich zum Schluss zu sprechen kommen. Benjamin, um dies vorauszunehmen... Benjamin may have been the oddest Marxist in a movement that didn't lack for oddities. What fascinated him was the doctrine of the superstructure. Though Marx touched on it only briefly, it played a completely disproportionate role in the movement because such a disproportionately large number of intellectuals, that is, people who were interested only in the superstructure, subscribed to it. Also Leuten, die nur am Überbau interessiert sind, sich ihr anschlossen. What fascinated Benjamin about the doctrine was, broadly speaking, that the intellectual and its material manifestation could be in such harmony that analogies, agreements, correspondences could be discovered everywhere, illuminating one another.
What mattered to him were the common properties of a street scene, a stock speculation, a poem, a thought, the hidden duct that holds them together or refers them to one another, so that the historian or the philologist can recognize that they all belong to the same era. Was Adorno einmal kritisch beanstandete, die staunende Darstellung der Faktizität. Adorno once raised critical objections to Benjamin's astonished presentation of the factual. But for Benjamin, that was the whole point. And it's also how his attempt to capture an image of history in the most inconspicuous traces of existence, in its refuse, should be understood. Benjamin had a passion for the small, for the smallest things. For him, the size of an object stood in inverse proportion to its meaning. This passion is also closely related to the idea of a primal phenomenon. No idea stands behind either of them. Consider his amazement at a seed, this tiny thing from which everything grows and whose concentrated meaning nothing that develops from it can interfere with. In other words, what most profoundly fascinated Benjamin from the start was never an idea, always a phenomenon. So it wasn't actually Marxism that diverted Benjamin from philosophy. He never really abandoned the position he took up in the Elective Affinities essay. His later works have little to do with Marxism or dialectical materialism. His central figure was the flaneur. It is the flaneur who roams at an aimless pace through hurrying big city crowds, to whom things reveal themselves in their secret meaning, for whom the true image of the past rushes by and who assembles it through memory. Nothing, of course, could be less dialectical than this posture, for which the angel of history, in the magnificent image of Benjamin's ninth thesis on the philosophy of history, does not move forward, dialectically advancing into the future, but rather has his face turned to the past. I quote, where a chain of events appears before us, he sees rather a single catastrophe, which incessantly heaps wreckage upon wreckage, hurling it all at his feet. He might well like to linger, to wake the dead and put the shattered pieces back together, but a storm blows in from paradise and drives him inexorably into the future to which he turns his back while the pile of wreckage before him mounts to the sky. This storm is what we call progress. Now, in this angel which Benjamin discerned in Paul Clay's Angelus Novus, the flaneur experiences his final transfiguration. So wird der Engel der Geschichte, der nichts betrachtet als das Trümmerfeld der Vergangenheit, vom Just as he, in the gesture of his aimless wandering, turns his back to the crowd he is being driven and swept away by, so the angel of history, who looks on nothing but the wreckage of the past, is blown backwards into the future by the storm of progress. Die Freundschaft Benjamin Brecht the Benjamin Brecht friendship is unique in that it brought together the greatest living German poet and the most significant critic of the age, and they knew it. At the news of Benjamin's death, Brecht is reported to have said that this was the first real loss Hitler had inflicted on German literature. <laughs> 
It must have been important for Benjamin to have found in Brecht a man of the left who thought just as undialectically as he did, but whose intelligence was unusually realistic, so that every idea immediately took on the most concrete and precise form. Sofort die allerkonkreteste und präziseste Gestalt annahm. Was den marxistisch gesinnten Freunden so sehr an Benjamin. What so displeased Benjamin's Marxist friends about his later work was, I quote Adorno, that pragmatic content is applied directly to related aspects of social history and that the metaphorical comes to replace the binding statement, which indeed suggests what these two utterly different people might have had in common. Both of them always dealt with the immediately real, the verifiably concrete, whose meaning is evident in itself. And in this highly realistic way of thinking, the superstructure-substructure relationship could have become, in a precise sense, metaphorical. If I may briefly explain. If, for example, you trace the abstract concept of Vernunft, or reason, back to its origin in the verb Vernehmen, or to proceed, you can feel you've restored the sensual substructure to a word from the sphere of the superstructure. You've transformed a concept into a metaphor. You must, of course, understand metaphor in its original sense of to transfer, to carry something across. For metaphor produces a connection, a counterpart, that appeals directly to the senses and requires no interpretation. Allegory, on the other hand, always emanates from an abstract notion in order to invent something manifest that has to be interpreted, which, it seems to me, too closely resembles a riddle we must guess at, even when the solution is as obvious as in the representation of death by a skeleton. That's English. <laughs> Ever since Homer, metaphor has been the knowledge communicating element of the poetic. With its help, in the Homeric epic, those things most remote to the senses are given their most exact counterparts, as when the approach of the armies to battle is likened to the tide driven by the wind, first rising up far away at sea in order to break, thundering and foaming on the craggy shore. In philosophy, conceptually speaking, this is the phenomenon of analogy. For Kant, it was important because it concerns not so much an imperfect similarity of two things as a perfect similarity of relationships between completely dissimilar things. In our example, the relationship of the tide to the shore and the relationship of the approaching army to the battle or the relationship of perception to objects of the sensual world and of reason to non-sensual objects. The miracle of such counterparts is that, despite their distance from each other, the agreement can be so exact. In Kantian thought, this agreement serves to bridge the chasm between the sensual and spiritual realms. Poetically, the counterparts of the metaphor are endowed with the unity of the sensual world. Zumeist dichterisch die Einheit der sinnlichen Welt geschriftete. Was an Benjamins sehr gedrängter Sprache manchmal schwer zu verstehen ist, ist niemals etwas besonders Kompliziertes. What is sometimes hard to understand in Benjamin's dense language is never anything especially complicated. 
It's his use of consistently metaphorical language, which is to say that without being a poet, he thought poetically. For him, the metaphor was the greatest gift of language, because it transforms the invisible into the sensual. A mighty fortress is our God. Relationships and not directly perceived things are made sensual and thus opened to experience. Und so erfahrbar zu machen. Er konnte ohne Schwierigkeiten die Überbautheorie als die endgültige Lehre metaphorischen Denkens begreifen, und zwar gerade weil. He easily grasped the theory of the superstructure as the ultimate tenet of metaphorical thinking, because he related the superstructure directly to the so called material substructure, which he interpreted sensually. He was openly fascinated by what others had branded vulgar, undialectical Marxist thinking. And this is crucial. In his fascination, he considered himself fully supported by Brecht. What appealed to him most about Brecht was what Brecht called crude thinking. The main thing, Brecht says, is to learn to think crudely. That is how the great think. And though Benjamin didn't put it that way, he expanded lucidly. There are many who understand the dialectician as a lover of subtleties. Crude thoughts belong in the household of dialectical thinking because they represent nothing other than the assignment of theory to practice. A thought must be crude in order to come into its own as action. Die Anweisung auf die Praxis als auf die Wirklichkeit. Und diese Wirklichkeit manifestierte sich für ihn am unmittelbarsten in der von Sprichwörtern und Redensarten erfüllten Alltagssprache. What appealed to Benjamin about crude thinking wasn't its assignment to practice so much as to reality. And he saw this reality most directly in the everyday language of proverbs and phrases. The proverb is a school for crude thinking, he wrote. He knew the art of taking sayings and idiomatic expression literally. So did Kafka, to whom they often gave inspiration and unlocked riddles. And this art allowed them both to write a prose of magical closeness to reality. Oft brennt die Zeit, in der ein Mensch lebt, dem am deutlichsten ihr Siegel auf, der von ihr am wenigsten geprägt ist, ihr am fernsten gestanden und daher am tiefsten unter ihr gelitten hat. So war es mit Proust. Often the time in which we live most distinctly marks those who are least touched by it, who stand farthest from it, and hence suffer the most under it. So it was with Proust, so it was with Karl Kraus, and so it was with Benjamin. Now, there was no lack of reasons to rebel against German-Jewish society in Imperial Germany. In A Berlin Childhood around 1900, Benjamin depicts his childhood home as a mausoleum intended for him. In my childhood, he says, I was a prisoner of the old city of Berlin and its new western boroughs. My clan inhabited both these quarters in an attitude of mixed stubbornness and self-assurance. The stubbornness was in Judaism. Only out of stubbornness did one hold fast to it. The self-assurance, however, lay in the non-Jewish environment where they had accomplished so much. Es geht also um das, was man damals seit den 1780er Jahren des vorigen Jahrhunderts die Judenfrage nannte und was es in dieser Form nur im deutschsprachigen Mitteleuropa je gegeben hat. We are talking about what, since the 1870s and 80s, had been called the Jewish question, 
in German-speaking Central Europe. While this major problem of those generations might seem minor to us, considering what happened later, one shouldn't skim over it, as I'm doing here, because neither Benjamin, nor Kafka, nor Karl Kraus can be understood apart from this Jewish background and their rebellion against it. I'll just point out that it was essentially a moral question and that it mattered only to a very few German Jewish authors whose intellectual rank it's clear only today distinguished them from all the others around them. This is what Kafka gelegentlich die Hölle des deutsch-jüdischen Schrifttums genannt hat. This is what Kafka occasionally called the hell of German Jewish literature. The only ways of rebelling against it at the time were Zionism on the one hand and communism on the other. Benjamin had a go at each, and uniquely for years he kept both paths open. In his letters, this outlook isn't only unique, but sometimes even comical. Immerhin zeigt dies deutlich, wie wenig er im Grunde an positiven Ideologien interessiert. At least it clearly demonstrates how little he cared about positive ideologies, how wrapped up he was in the negative criticism of existing conditions. We can thank this attitude of superiority, rejecting every solution, every redemption, for his deepest insights. Position bezogen, die damals sowohl menschlich wie finanziell unhaltbar war. But Benjamin had fashioned a position that was both humanly and financially untenable, because it drove him into complete isolation. He himself characterized it as that of a man on a sinking ship who climbs to the top of a mast that's about to break. Und dies wird nirgends eklatanter als in einem an sich sehr schönen Brief Gerhard Scholems an den Freund. For such a position, there was only misunderstanding. Nowhere more glaring than in a beautiful letter from Gershom Scholem to his friend. He warns of the dangers of Marxism, then adds that Benjamin has ruined his chances of becoming the legitimate bearer of the richest and truest traditions of Hamann and von Humboldt. Scholem appeals here to what he calls the morality of insight, but he doesn't see that it's just this morality that absolutely forbade Benjamin from returning to or carrying on any tradition, including Jewish tradition. I now come to Benjamin's position on the past and tradition. But first I would like to read you a few lines from Shakespeare's The Tempest. Benjamin loved mottos, and I imagine that he would have liked my motto for this question. Mein motto, I sage it in English, I will then in Deutsch lesen, falls here. Full fathom five, thy father lies, of his bones are coral made, those are pearls that wear his eyes, nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a seat change into something rich and strange. Das Deutsche, fünf Faden tief liegt Vater dein, sein Gebein wird zu Korallen, Perlen sind die Augen sein, nichts an ihm, das soll verfallen, das nicht wandelt, Meereshut in ein reich und seltenes Gut. Sie werden sehen, dass ich mit diesen Zahlen, die Sie ja sicher alle kennen, ein wenig spielen werde, um zu erklären, um was es sich hier eigentlich handelt. Sofern Vergangenheit als Tradition überliefert ist, hat sie Autorität. Insofar as the past is handed down as tradition, it has authority. 
Insofar as authority presents itself historically, it will be taken for tradition. Benjamin knew that the break with tradition and the loss of authority were irreparable. From this, he deduced the need to discover new ways of dealing with the past. He became a master in this field when he saw that the transmissibility of the past had been replaced by its citability, and in place of its authority it had taken on the ghostly power to settle piece by piece in the present and rob it of the peace of mindless complacency. He said, quotations in my work are like armed robbers who surprise idlers on the road and make off with their convictions. Aber wenn auch erst der Verzweifelnde, nämlich der an der Gegenwart Verzweifelnde, im Zitat... But even if someone in despair over the present discovers in the quotation the strength not to preserve but to cleanse, to rip out of context, to destroy, this discoverer of the destructive is nevertheless inspired by the intent to preserve. And only because he won't be fooled by the professional preservers of the past, of values, of the positive, or of anything else, does he finally discover, as Benjamin says, that the destructive power of the quotation is the only hope for a few things to survive from this era, precisely because they've been torn out of it. In dieser Form von dem, was er Denkbruchstücke nannte, in this form, which he called a thought fragment, the quotation has the task of interrupting the flow of representation with transcendental force, as well as of gathering up what was represented into itself. The weight it carries in Benjamin's work can only be compared to the quite different authoritarian quotation that replaces coherent reasoning in the treatises of the Middle Ages. Ich erwähnte, glaube ich, bereits, dass Benjamins zentrale Leidenschaft das Sammeln war. As I've said, Benjamin's central passion was collecting. It began early on with what he called not his bibliophilia, but his bibliomania, which soon turned into his even more characteristic collecting of quotations. Aber lassen Sie uns mit der Bibliothek anfangen. But let's begin with the library. His inner need to own a library, he said, asserted itself around 1916, at the same time he was studying Romanticism as the last movement that continued the attempt to preserve tradition. Even in this passion for his heritage, there is already a certain destructive force, something he discovered much later, when he had already lost his belief in tradition and the indestructibility of the world. What he first discovered was that the past spoke only through things that have not been handed down, for example, through the German Baroque, whose seeming proximity to the present was only owing to its exotic character, which thus ruled out all claims to authority. An die Stelle des verpflichtenden Waren trat das in irgendeinem... The bindingly truthful was replaced by the randomly significant, which for Benjamin meant that the consistency of truth had been lost. ...dass die Konsistenz der Wahrheit verloren gegangen ist. Zur Konsistenz der Wahrheit gehört... Part of the consistency of truth, at least for Benjamin, lies in its having to do with a secret, and in the disclosure of this secret having authority. Truth, said Benjamin, shortly before he became fully aware of the irreparable break with tradition and the loss of authority, is not an unveiling that destroys the secret, but rather the disclosure that does it justice. <laughs> 
War diese Wahrheit erst einmal an dem ihr gemäßen geschichtlichen Augenblick in die Menschenwelt getreten, so war es diese ja eigentümliche Konsistenz, die sie gewissermaßen hand. It was this peculiar consistency of truth that rendered it manageable, so to speak, and capable of being handed down. Tradition transforms truth into wisdom, and wisdom is the consistency of transmissible truth. In other words, even if truth existed in our world, it could not lead to wisdom, because it no longer possesses the qualities it can attain only through the universal recognition of its validity. Benjamin spricht über diese Dinge anlässlich Kafkas und sagt, Benjamin speaks of these things in connection with Kafka and says, Kafka, of course, was far from being the first to face this fact, this loss of tradition and truth. Many had adapted to it, clinging to truth, or what they regarded as truth at the time, and, heavy or light-heartedly, relinquishing the idea of its transmissibility. Das eigentlich Geniale an Kafka, sagt Benjamin, the true genius of Kafka, Benjamin said, was that he tried out something completely new. He relinquished truth in order to cling to its transmissibility. Schon Kafka griff also in den Meeresgrund des Vergangenen, hatte diese eigentümliche Doppelheit von Bewahren und Destruieren wollen an sich. Kafka's combing of the sea bottom of the past already had this peculiarly dualistic desire to preserve and destroy it. He wanted to preserve it, even if it wasn't truth, if only for the sake of this new beauty in what is vanishing. Then again, Kafka knew that you can't smash tradition more effectively than by chipping the rich and the strange, the coral and the pearls, out of what has been handed down. Nun, diese Zweideutigkeit der Gäste mit Bezug auf die Vergangenheit hat Benjamin am Typus des Sammlers, und das heißt natürlich an sich selbst, auf einzigartige Weise dargelegt. Benjamin, as a collector, typified this ambiguity of gesture with respect to the past. The collector had motives that were opaque even to him. Collecting is, as Benjamin was the first to stress, the passion of children for whom things don't yet have any true character. Collecting is the hobby of the rich, who have enough that they no longer need anything useful and so can afford to make the transfiguration of objects, as Benjamin put it, their business. Und sofern sich das Sammeln an jeden Gegenstand hängen kann und diesen Gegenstand damit als Ding gleich In so far as collecting can fasten onto any category of object and thus as it were liberate the object so that it is no longer useful no longer the means to an end and retains only its intrinsic worth Collecting is for Benjamin an activity with revolutionary implications. The collector, like the revolutionary, he says, does not dream of himself only in a distant or bygone world, but also in a better one, in which people are just as meagerly provided with what they need as in real life, but in which things are liberated from the drudgery of usefulness. Collecting is the redemption of things, which complements the redemption of man. Ursprünglich aber ist die Haltung des Sammlers im höchsten Sinne die Haltung des Erben, also keineswegs des Revolutionär. But originally, the collector's attitude is, in the highest sense, that of the heir. Not at all that of the revolutionary, who settles into the past, as Benjamin said, in order to rebuild the old world undisturbed by the present. Yet upon closer inspection, we find some remarkable features in this deepest urge of the collector. There is first the gesture, so significant for our time, with which the collector not only retreats from public into private life, but also takes objects that once belonged to the public with him in order to rescue them. Ferner, 
from this passion for the past, for its own sake, a curious fact emerges. Tradition may do badly in the hands of the air. Its tradition may do badly in the hands of the air. Its so-called values not nearly so well preserved as it might have seemed at first glance. Die Über der Überlieferung ist es eigen, das Vergangene zu ordnen, und zwar nicht nur chronologisch, sondern auch systematisch. It is for tradition to organize the past, not only chronologically, but also systematically. To separate the positive from the negative, to single out the binding and the authoritative from the bulk of irrelevant or merely interesting phenomena. Nur unsystematisch, sie grenzt ans Chaotische, und zwar nicht the collector's passion, however, is not only unsystematic, it borders on the chaotic. This isn't because it is passion, but because it's not sparked primarily by the quality of the object, which is classifiable, but by its authenticity, its uniqueness, which explodes all systematic classification. So while tradition clarifies the past, the collector levels all differences. And this leveling, as Benjamin says, positive and negative, predilection and rejection here collide. This leveling takes place even if the collector has made tradition itself his area of expertise and carefully eliminated all that it does not recognize. Gegen die Tradition setzt der Sammler das Kriterium der Echtheit. Gegen das Maßgebliche, das Signum des Ursprungs, gegen eine inhaltliche Qualität also. Against tradition, the collector pits the criteria of genuineness, against the authoritative, the sign of origin. Thus, against content, to put this way of thinking in theoretical terms, pure originality or authenticity, which French existentialism first established as a quality detached from all specific characteristics. If you carry this way of thinking to its logical end point, you arrive at a curious reversal of the original drive to collect. I quote, the authentic image may be old, but the authentic thought is new. It is today's. This today may be meager, be that as it may, one must take it by the horns in order to be able to question the past. It is the bull whose blood must fill the pit if the spirits of the departed are to appear at its edge. Aus dieser für die Beschwörung der Vergangenheit geopferten Gegenwart From this present sacrifice to the conjuration of the past arises what Benjamin calls the deadly impact of thought directed against the past as authority and tradition or as he put it tie yourself not to the good old but to the bad new Unversehens verwandelt sich so der Erbe und Bewahrer in einen Zerstörer. Thus the heir and preserver turns into a destroyer. Benjamin says, the true, quite misunderstood passion of the collector is always anarchistic and destructive, for this is its dialectic, to combine loyalty to the object, to individual items in his care, with a stubborn, subversive protest against the typical and classifiable. Der Sammler zerstört den Zusammenhang, in dem sein Gegenstand The collector destroys the context in which his object was once a part of a larger living whole. Since he cares only for the truly unique, he must cleanse his chosen object of everything in it that is characteristic. Muss er den erwählten Gegenstand von allem reinigen, was an ihm typisch ist. The amazing revival of classical culture, which began in Europe in the 20s, has, since the 1940s, perhaps been felt most strongly in comparatively traditionless America. It was ushered in by those who were most clearly aware of the irreparability of the break with tradition, in Germany, and not only there, first, and foremost by Martin Heidegger.
Heidegger had an extraordinary nose for what had been transformed from living eyes and bones into pearls and coral, and as such could only be expanded on through the violence of interpretation, that is, the violence of new thoughts. For this reason, Benjamin, without knowing it, had considerably more in common with him than with the dialectical subtleties of his Marxist friends. Seit dem Wahlverwandtschaftsaufsatz jedenfalls steht im Zentrum jeder Arbeit von From the Elective Affinities essay on, the quotations stand at the center of every one of Benjamin's works. This differentiates them from academic papers, in which quotations have the task of validating and documenting opinions, and so can be relegated to the notes. Not so with Benjamin. When he was working on his study of German tragedy, he assembled a collection of more than 600 quotations. This wasn't merely an accumulation of excerpts to facilitate the writing. Rather, it represented the principal work, next to which the writing was secondary. The principal work consisted of ripping fragments out of their context and rearranging them so that they illuminated one another and justified their being there, even though they were floating free. This involved a sort of surrealist montage. His ideal, to produce a work that consisted only of quotations, so masterfully assembled that it could forego any accompanying text, might appear self-destructive or bizarre. But it was no more so than the surrealist experiments of the time. If an accompanying text couldn't be avoided, it had to be shaped so as to preserve, in Benjamin's words, the intentions of such investigations, which are to plumb the depths of language and thought by drilling rather than excavating, so as not to ruin everything with explanations that seek to provide a causal or systematic connection. I emphasize the words drilling rather than excavating because these metaphors are the real key to what Benjamin had in mind. It was just as clear to him that this new method of drilling forces out certain insights as it creates certain obscurities, as he wrote in an early letter to Hoffmannsthal. Above all, he wanted to avoid everything that could suggest empathy or communication, as if the object under examination had a message that communicated itself to the reader or viewer on its own. No poem, he wrote, is meant for the reader, no painting for the viewer, no symphony for the listener. Unter diesem Motto, sehr früh schon formuliert, steht alle Literaturkritik bei Benjamin. Benjamin's literary criticism should be understood vis-à-vis -vis this motto, formulated early on, which means considerably more than an affront to an audience or a Dadaist shock effect. It is about the conviction, as he writes, that certain issues, above all linguistic ones, may maintain their best sense when they are not applied exclusively to humanity. So durfte von einem unvergesslichen Leben oder Augenblick gesprochen werden, auch wenn alle. Thus could one speak of unforgettable lives or moments, even if everyone had forgotten them. If their essence demands that they not be forgotten, then unforgettable would not be a falsehood, but rather a claim that is not being fulfilled by humanity, as well as a reference to a place where it is being fulfilled, in God's remembrance. Auf den theologischen Hintergrund 
hat Benjamin später verzichtet. Benjamin later relinquished this theological background, but not the method of drilling up the essence from quotations as one drills up water from an underground spring. The drilling is the same as conjuring up, and what is conjured up invariably reveals itself as something that has suffered a Shakespearean sea change, from living eye to pearl, from living bone to coral. For Benjamin, to quote is to name, and naming rather than speaking, the word rather than the sentence, brings truth to light. Und nicht der Satz bringen für Benjamin Wahrheit an den Tag. Es hat seine guten Gründe jetzt, dass Benjamins frühe philosophische Interessen sich an Sprachphilosophie orientieren. There are good reasons that Benjamin's early philosophical interest turned toward linguistic philosophy, that finally quotation becomes for him the only possible fitting way to deal with the past without the help of tradition. Jede Epoche, der ihre eigene Vergangenheit in einem solchen Maß Every era whose past is as questionable as ours must finally confront the phenomenon of language, for the past is ineradicably embedded in language. Und an ihr scheitern alle Versuche, es endgültig loszuwerden. The Greek polis will remain at the very bottom of our political existence, that is, at the bottom of the sea, for as long as we utter the word politics. This is what semanticists, who with good reason attack language as the bulwark behind which the past hides, fail to understand. They are absolutely right that all problems are, in the end, linguistic problems, only they don't realize what they're implying. But Benjamin, who could not yet have read Wittgenstein, let alone his successors, was very well informed about these things, because for him the problem of truth appeared from the beginning on, as he put it, as a revelation that must be heard, that is, that lies in a metaphysical, acoustic sphere. So language for him wasn't primarily the faculty that distinguishes human beings from other living creatures, but just the opposite, the world essence from which speech arises. I quote Benjamin, there is thus a language of truth, in which the last secrets towards which all thought labors are preserved, silent and without tension. And this is the true language whose existence we assume unthinkingly as soon as we translate from one language into another. Whatever theoretical revisions Benjamin may subsequently have made to these theological metaphysical convictions, he always retained his basic approach to literary studies, not to assess the utility or communicative value of linguistic creations, but to understand understand them in their crystallized and thus fundamentally fragmentary form, as the intentionless and non-communicative utterances of a world essence. What else can this mean but that he understands language through poetry? And with that I have only repeated, in a somewhat complicated way, that we are dealing with something that may not be unique but is still extremely rare the gift of thinking poetically. This thinking, nurtured by the present, works with the thought fragments it can wrest from the past and gather about itself, like the pearl diver who descends to the bottom of the sea not to excavate the whole sea floor and lift it to the light of day, but to pry the rich and strange pearls and coral from out of the deep and rescue them by bringing them up to the surface as fragments. Tages zu retten, taucht es in die Tiefen der Vergangenheit.
He dives into the depths of the past, but not to revive it or to contribute to the renewal of bygone times. What guides this thinking is the conviction that while the living may be laid waste by time, this process of decay is at the same time a process of crystallization, that in the depths of the sea, an unhistorical element in which everything historical decays, new crystalline forms and shapes arise that will last immune to the elements. They are only waiting for the pearl diver to bring them up into the world of the living as thought fragments or even as the everlasting primal phenomena. I believe that Walter Benjamin was such a pearl diver. Thank you.